Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Oh Shoot. I'm your host, Cassidy Lynn, and we have a guest on the podcast today. I am chatting with John Branch the Fourth. And honestly, you guys all probably know who he is because he pops up all over all my socials and everything. So it's an honor to have John on the podcast. Um, John, why don't you say hi to everyone? Give everyone a little intro about, you know, who you are and what you do. Oh, hello. Thanks for having me. And um, again, as said, I'm John Branch the Fourth, and I'm a wedding photographer in the Raleigh, North Carolina area who got his start in the New York area. I've been doing it for about 10 years now and also am a YouTube content creator, which I've been doing that for about three years now, maybe four, somewhere in okay. that range. That's really cool. How did YouTube integrate into like your wedding photography career? Because I know you weren't always like filming yourself. So like at what point did that start? Yeah. So um, when I went full-time photography, because I was working at a day job, I was working at Squarespace for about four to five years when I started my photography business, which was a grind. It was the absolute worst because um, my wife and I, we were starting to have kids at that point. So like every day, like it was just, you know, commute into the city to work at Squarespace to finish up a session, like an engagement session after work to come home late. And it was just a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So when we decided to move to North Carolina, I had to quit Squarespace because they were only in the tri-state area at the time. And um, I came down here and I actually, I had a YouTube channel in the past. So YouTube was already kind of in my blood. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to start a YouTube channel on photography stuff for whatever. And yeah, it just kind of took off. Like, I really never expected it to become an actual thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. Do So with YouTube comes like recording yourself and stuff. How did you learn like the video side of it then? Because I know like a lot of it is just like. Like you set up your camera, you have to have good lighting and like the frame rate, like how did that come into play? Yeah. Um, so me, it really was a culmination of all the years of stuff I have been doing. Um, so I actually, I went to school for music production and sound design at Berkeley College of Music. Um, so audio and music was my thing. And I actually had been working in a post audio house when I was in New York for about three to four ish years. So for that, we were mixing audio for music or excuse me, for TV shows and um, commercials. So that was what first kind of started bringing me over to understanding video more. And then when I started doing photography, I just kind of started learning video on the side. So you take my audio skills that I already had, kind of understanding it from commercial side, plug in the photo side, so composition, exposure, all that stuff, and then, yeah, and then I just slowly started understanding frame rates and stuff and just kind of getting into it. And then, yeah, it just all kind of came together right. really well. Because I, I remember when I started YouTube, a lot of people were just like, oh, your production quality is so high. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. That's so cool how like everything that you like, it was like kind of like a built up moment where it all kind of makes sense. Like that kind of is what YouTube feels like. Like your everything that you're doing comes together in one place and then yeah. it like su succeeds really well. That's really cool. Yeah, that's actually, um, that's how editing was so easy for me as well, because basically I was approaching it as an audio editor, but the way that you edit video is very closely the same to audio. So that's like the easy door inside. So yeah, it all just really like came mm -hmm. right together. So you were talking about how you worked at Squarespace and then you transitioned to full-time photography. How did you know that that was like the right time to go full-time? Like, was it like a financial decision? Was it like a bookings decision or time? Like what kind of brought you over the edge? Oh my goodness. Um, so I, I tend to be a risk taker um, and shout out to my wife for honestly backing up my risks. <laughs> a lot of the times, actually, once having to support a family, I became the one who was a little bit more cautious. She'd be like, you'll be fine, whatever. But um, at that particular time, I was starting to get to a place where I couldn't take as much photography work as I wanted to because of the day job. So there was that. 
Um, we just ended up getting like a lump sum of money from like some Squarespace stuff that happened. And so we had money to live off of. So we literally, when I, when I tell you we dipped, we just left. Like even my managers at the time, because I just walked in one day, it was like two week notice. And mind you, I was like an entry level manager. So it wasn't just like, I was like, you know, the starting position. Like I was higher up. I had a whole team and I was like two week notice. What's good. And they're like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. Um, and so we moved and it was a new market as well. But that's what really, the fact that I I really felt like I could do well if I had the time, the mm-hmm. fact that I wasn't able to book as much as I wanted to, but I did kind of like, we riskily, I had nothing, like I'd never shot in the North Carolina area. The only tie to it I had was the fact that I'm from here, born and raised. Okay. And that was it. We had a little bit of money to live off of. And we pretty much were like, you know what, if it doesn't work, my resume is decent enough. Like I'm sure I can get a job and just did it. Right. It was kind of scary. <laughs> how did you manage to like get bookings then in North Carolina? Cause like you, I mean, I'm sure you had some ties, but like you said, like you just kind of like jumped into a fresh market that you'd never been in before. Yeah, a lot of it was trying to establish my name in the area. And I, I pretty much jumped at anything I could do. So I had a bunch of style shoots that came up, um, which got my name around planners and stuff. Um, I actually fairly early on started getting published in like the knot or either print or just online. Um, I did a wedding expo in the area, which was like the one wedding expo that helped um, and then, and again, I have strong words for them, but I was on the knot Yeah. and that, that first year I was on them in North Carolina went extremely well. Mm-hmm. Um, so just, yeah, pretty much putting myself out wherever I could. Like I was doing, oh yeah, I, um, if you've ever heard of the big fake wedding, no. it's like something this company puts on, it's basically a giant styled shoot. Oh. Um, but they do it in different areas of the country And they bring like multiple photographers. Like I was doing everything I could to get my name out there. Right. Mainly styled shoots, hitting up planners and the knot and just advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You kind of have to do like a mix of everything to figure out like what works and what's actually going to stick. And then you can continue to like work on, you know, if it's Instagram or whatever, like whatever sticks. Yeah. Um, So we didn't, I didn't tell you that I want to talk about this, but you mentioned it. So You mentioned the knot and I was also (laughs) on the knot. So I would love to talk about it for a little bit because I think I saw you posted something like a YouTube video about it as well. Yeah. Um, So I guess like maybe just share like your experience and like a little bit of your thoughts behind it and then we can go from there. Yeah. The knot is interesting. And again, the, the, for everyone who hasn't heard the video I posted was about an article that came out saying that um, ex employees of the knot, basically we're whistleblowing the fact that the knot is super shady and gives people fake spam leads and stuff, which photographers forever have been like, I swear these are spam. Mm -hmm. Um, So that article comes out and I'm like, okay, now my experience with the knot, I was on them when I was in New York, which didn't go well at all. And I was on them when I switched to North Carolina as well. But when I switched to them going to North Carolina, I paid for the top tier everything. Um, So I had like the banner at the top. I was like in the first three at the very top of the page. Um, In my first year, I booked like 40 weddings, majorly from the knot. And what I found is interesting. And after seeing the article, it felt like after the first year, it's almost like they siphon the real leads. Mm -hmm. And so when someone's new, and especially if they're paying a lot, they'll be like, great, siphon in the real ones to him. And so he'll be like, well, the knot's amazing. And then we'll like slowly back off. And and then it'll just be like, oh, you know, try other methods to get more. So overall, the knot wasn't horrible. And then they merged with Wedding Wire, which I absolutely hate Wedding Wire. Yeah. Um, (laughs) So yeah, after that, I was like over. And then, (laughs) not to make the story long, so recently I was like, huh, maybe I'll get back on the knot. Because right now where I'm at, especially with content creation, I'm trying to take maybe five to 10 weddings a year. So I was like, maybe I'll get on the knot again just to have another lane of like advertising. It was like mad expensive. And the salesperson on the phone was extra pushy. 
Mm-hmm. And it was like sad because I had to pull like, I'm a content creator and I don't need the work card, which I don't like pulling that card because it's mm-hmm. just, you know, you're like, oh, don't you know who I am? Like, I really, yeah. <laughs> but, but like they just kept pushing and I'm like, I don't need your leads. Right. I was going to pay you just because like literally right. the worst. Yeah. All the I worst actually, I ended up blocking the Knots phone number oh. because <laughs> I was literally, I like would answer and be like, I'm not interested. Please stop calling me. I was also on the knot my first, I think it was, yeah, my first year doing weddings. Um, I was in upstate New York and what I discovered is the area I was in was pretty touristy. Like a lot of people would come from New York city Mm. to get married there. So the knot was a really good resource because you know, that's where people were looking for photographers. Yeah. Cause they didn't know any vendors around. So it worked for me, I would say like a year as well. And then my second year, it was like, okay, I have all this experience now from my first year. And now I'm getting way more bookings from just word of mouth or social media. And I think that second year, I only had a couple of weddings from The Knot. And even still, I was finding that the ones that I booked from The Knot were like, I don't know, like not necessarily like like my style wasn't what they wanted or it just yeah. like there was some, something was like not right there with like the, when they went to book, like something wasn't communicated. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree how you feel is also how I feel. I've always been scared to talk about it because I actually went and reviewed like the not contract that I signed with them way back in the day. And it said like, I couldn't, you can't talk about it. I know. Watch but them I'm, come find me. <laughs> I know, but but it's also like if ex employees are coming out, like I'm the least of their worries at this point. Well, it was funny because after I made that video, they sent out an email to everyone because they had like a new um, marketing thing, and so I'm like half and half because I really like, I always kind of like the brand, and they also they do still have the magazine, so it's not like they're just gonna disappear because someone's like, well, they're shady. So I was like, maybe I should. And they have um, they have their own like educators and they do like conferences and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, I'm definitely probably not speaking to any of those. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I ever signed up for it, they'd be like, wait a minute, aren't you that guy who was hating on us on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It also <laughs> makes you wonder, like, was the not kind of a big thing back in the day? But I feel like now it's not as big. Like- yeah. Because, yeah, I think almost what I would call like the golden age of photography, which was like probably 2005 to 10-ish. And I didn't even, I didn't start until like 14. Because that's when like, I feel like like the Ben Sassos and the Heish and all that. Like there's a lot of people mm-hmm. that are like known in the industry, but that was when they were doing it. So yeah, The Knot was probably popping back then. Because all the workshops I used to go to when I first started were like, oh yeah, get on The Knot. It'll be great. Right. Yeah, but now I feel like people don't want to be advertised to. Like, they almost want to find people, like, organically on their own. Like, that's kind of, like, this, ge- like, generation of people getting married, like, want to discover their own things. They don't they don't want to, like, be recommended something. Or if they do, like, they want to, like, genuinely like it for their themselves, I guess. Like, it's very individual, like, yeah. an, an individualistic mindset right now. So. Which is cool. That's... For me, it's been interesting because I'm not the youngest anymore. <laughs> and so like just watching the trends and how things change has been really interesting as far as advertising because that's something I'm still trying to nail down myself because I feel mm-hmm. aged out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, there's just like everything changes so much. And even if you try, like if you went and like started posting these like trend videos, people would be like, who is this? Like, you know, like, I feel like, like even me, I'm like, oh, people can tell I'm 25. Like, they're going to be like, who's this girl? That's, she's trying too hard. So it's like, I almost feel like you just kind of have to stick with what works. The timeless marketing, just leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into weddings because that's what I wanted to talk to you about for this episode. Um, Cause you're like, experienced pro wedding photographer and we've we've got some some things to dish um so first thing I wanted to ask you in this topic is just like gear let's just start with like what do you shoot on what's your preferred lenses and like kind of explain it a little bit yeah um so I'm the the elephant in the room so I shoot with Fujifilm 
Um, oh. Absolutely love Fujifilm. Mm -hmm. um, when I did start, I started on Canon. But as far as my lenses, and this is for everyone who needs the crop sensor conversion, I'll let y'all know what it's equivalent to. Because again, gear is gear. I think you use what you want to use, but mm -hmm. Fujifilm is crop sensor mainly, but I love their cameras. Um, I usually bring four lenses with me to a wedding. I have a 16 mil, which in full frame is 24. Um, a 23, which in full frame is a 35. A 33, which in full frame is about a 50. And then a 56, which is pretty much an 85. So okay. those are my four lenses. And then for any macro shots, I actually bring an extension tube. And I use my 56 or 85 and just make it longer so I can get those macro shots. And that's it, just four prime lenses. I'm a huge fan of prime lenses. Um, then after that, we have flashes. I also like to keep that simple. Um, I use the Godox V862, which is just one of their standard flashes. I think the newer version now is like the V1. Um, but the V862, and I have four of those if I'm doing off a camera flash. But I normally, I don't like doing it. I'll do it if it's needed, but it's just so much extra, like, oh, to stand in the flash and the in the mm -hmm. thing and the modifiers. <laughs> oh, and speaking of modifiers, um, I use MagMod, MagSphere religiously. Okay. And that's pretty much my setup. Four yeah. flashes, four lenses, two cameras. And you're good to go. And that's it. Do you ever feel like you're, so you said you're using a 56, which is like an 85. Do you ever feel like that is not long enough on a wedding day? Like, are you ever wanting something that's even longer? Oh, yeah. So it depends. Um, sometimes, and this I learned the hard way moving back to the South. There's a lot of churches down here that are just like extra and Luckily, the first time I had this issue, the bride was like, I don't really care about the ceremony photos. I was so mad. The church was beautiful. And it was just, it was the, and I was so, I was like, yeah, about to be great photos. And they were like, yeah, you got to stand in the back. You can't go nowhere. You can't move anywhere. You can't, and I was just like, great. I only have an 85. So I do shoot with a 90, which is more like a 110. But normally that's only if I know that I'm going to have a ceremony like that. Usually I don't like to... I've never been the type, and I learned this from New York, I don't like having like all these extra bags. And yeah. it's just so much extra stuff. And you always hear all these horror stories of people's stuff getting stolen. Like, mm -hmm. I wear my stuff on me. If you're going to steal it, you have to deal with me, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it also, it makes it easily accessible. So it's like rare that I'm bringing like an extra bag with 50 right. extra flashes and stuff. Yeah. You just, you want to make sure. I feel like sometimes less is more on a wedding day. Obviously it's good to be prepared, but when it comes to like the actual functionality of it, like if you're that photographer, that's like dangling around and like everything's all over the place, you're fumbling your lenses. Cause you've got so much going on. Like, yeah, that's almost like a hindrance to your shooting a little bit. Well, and that's the thing sometimes too. I I've always taken a, an approach of like solve the problems with the things you have because Wedding days can already be stressful. So you really have to sit down with yourself and think about what type of person you are. If you're not a very decisive person, bringing 10 different lens options is going to make your day more stressful because all you're going to do is like, oh, maybe I should use this. Oh, but what if I need that? But what if I, but what if, but what if, but what if, and then something else happens on the wedding day and now you're not even cool with your own gear because you can't make the decision. So I am decisive. So even if I had 10 Lenses, I know that I would just be like, yeah, 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 it's fine. But I like not having choices. I like it to be like, well, if you're shooting this thing, this is how you shoot it. And that, mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah. You know, I think I just realized with you saying that, I think I am the indecisive photographer because I shoot with my husband and I will like go up to him and be like, be on a 50, get this shot. And then I'll, two minutes later, I'll be like, just kidding, switch to the 85. <laughs> and then I'll be like, you know what? Just kidding, go back to the 50. And he's like, what do you want me to do? Like, just like pick something. So I think having, like you said, like limiting your options, because at the end of the day, as long as you have a camera and a lens, you're going to be able to capture it. Exactly. Is it, is it going to be exactly how you pictured it? Maybe not. Like if you wanted something like more blown out or more wide, whatever, but like, yeah, it, you've got the ability to physically capture it. So yeah, yeah. that's really good advice. That's like really hitting home for me. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about your shooting on a wedding day. What does your shooting look like? What are some of the shots that you look for 
um, with those lenses that you use? Like what are the specific shots you're getting with each of them? Yeah. Um, so generally, since I like to use two cameras at the same time, especially since I'm on primes, I don't have to switch them as often. Basically throughout the day, there's certain lens combos I'm always using at specific times of the day. So like during getting ready, we're usually in hotel rooms or, you know, suites that are smaller ish. So I'm usually always on my 35 and 50. Maybe I'll break out the 24, but that's not often. And so because my day is broken down into sections like that, and I know which lenses I have, then it's more of like the way that I shoot each of the things. So, you know, getting ready, it's, you know, bride or groom or whoever with a parent or a maid of honor or best whoever. And I'll do those shots. And usually my wider lenses are always for contextual shots. That's going to get people in the area we're in. And then like my 50 is always going to be for close up and detail. So like a hand in a ring or hands buttoning the dress. And I follow that throughout the day. And then when I move to ceremony, I start with my 35 and 50 and then switch to 35 and 85. And then same thing. Um, I like to get you know, a wide of the ceremony. I actually, I've started doing um, the Brent Iser technique, if you're familiar with it, for the ceremony at the beginning. That's where you take multiple shots, but focused mm -hmm. on the couple and then combine them as like a yeah. panoramic. Yeah. Um, I'll do that with my 85. And then, yeah, the end of the day is 35, 50. Dance floor is 24 and 50, but I don't really shoot the 50 at all. It's literally just the 24 the whole way. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the main approach. Okay. And with your flashes, when are the times you find yourself most frequently using flashes? Like, are you the person that will always have the flash ready? Like, what what do you do? Oh, no, I'm natural light photographer through and through. So if I don't have to use the flash, I won't. I like rather not. Okay. Um, now, again, because I wear my bag on my back with my flashes, if I do walk in a room and it's like a dungeon, I can <laughs> easily pop it out real quick. But usually it's once we get to the reception, flashes on immediately. Mm -hmm. Or if for some reason something's like super backlit and I need to fill a little bit. But generally, yeah, it's rare that I'm using the flash at all during the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, same. I Sometimes I feel bad using the flash. I almost feel like sometimes I'm a little bit of a distraction. I like the idea of being the fly on the wall to the point where it's like, you can't even hear my shutter. You can't even yeah. like, am I the photographer? Or am I just a guest <laughs> that pulled out their camera? You know, like I want to be so discreet because I think it's so distracting when the flash is just firing all the time. Yeah. So I would say I'm in the same boat as you. Um, okay. So let's talk about your posing. So we talked about gear. When you are shooting weddings, this is always something that I think about because I, this is what I do. Do you use the same poses like wedding after wedding or do you try to change things up a little bit? Like, Oh yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll give you my long weird analogy, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. but, um, so when it comes to weddings in general, I like to have a format always because again, they're stressful days. They can fall apart easily. And I found what will mainly stress people out is not having some type of, this is exactly how it goes every time. So yeah, I could probably, maybe I'll make a video about it too. I could go through all my weddings and show you the exact same photo at every wedding because I do okay. it every time. Mm -hmm. um, so my analogy for all this, and usually I talk about it when people ask me about, do I need to see the venue before the wedding? But because I majored in music, I play saxophone, so I play jazz. And with jazz, you normally improvise, which is literally making it up as you're playing the song. But the thing, because a lot of people hear that, I'm like, how do you just like make up what you're playing? Like, how do they do that? And it's not because we're just fully making it up. When you're playing a song, you have the chart in front of you with the chord changes. So that's like the foundation. Like, you know where you are. It's like a map. Mm -hmm. And so the things that I do on a wedding day that are always the same are like my chord changes. And then okay. I improvise within them. So, you know, when I do getting ready bride, I know I'm taking specific shots and then when and if creative things happen, then I take those shots. But yeah, I take the literal exact same photos mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. every single wedding. And I'm I'm sure, and especially for newer photographers, sometimes it's like, no, oh, but it's not art. It's not creative. Like, why are you? <laughs> and it's like, I'm I'm trying to get paid first off. And then second off, I don't want to be stressed all day trying to find creativity. Because, you know, sometimes you go to a play or just certain days, you're just not feeling it like that. But when I know if I walk in the room and there's a window here, groom's going right there and mm-hmm. the wall is clear enough and the light's going to be side lit and it's going to be bomb. I'm going to yeah. do it every time. You know, like <laughs> I, I like that approach. Yeah. It just it keeps me from being stressed. I don't like being stressed. <laughs> right. Like I feel like as photographers, we need a format or like we need some sort of rough like yeah like almost like a like framework that happens at every wedding I always think about the fact that like someone's wedding like yes you've shot hundreds of weddings but like they've never been married before so uh, most of the time so they don't want like they want the classic shots that you're you get every single wedding like that's what they're looking forward to is like that classic like mom helping you get your dress on or like you know those the same poses like that's what that's what they're looking for and that's actually like why they hired you because you're the professional and you have so much experience that like it's like a guarantee that you're gonna give them the photos that they want so it's almost like like yeah sometimes you're creative sometimes you're not but like having the framework is super important do you like ever do things to kind of spice things up and keep things interesting for like creativity wise during a wedding? Oh yeah. Always. Like one of, one of my biggest pet peeves on a wedding day oh, is when um like planners or venue coordinators try to tell me where to take photos because they're like, this is where everyone, I, I hate that this is where everyone takes the photo unless it's just that bomb of a location. Mm-hmm. Um, so I tend to always be the photographer who goes out of my way to find something that's like different. And I always love it when I'm at a venue and a venue coordinator is like, whoa, no one's ever thought to take a photo there. And I'm like, yeah, that's the <laughs> point. So again, going back to what you were saying, like, I do believe like as a wedding photographer, we have a product. And just like if I went to the store to go buy something, I don't want to go to the store to buy the same thing and every other week it's different. And I'm like, what? Well, I just had this and it was good and I just wanted to. So it's the same thing. Like it may feel lame as a wedding photographer. Like I said, I could literally go back and be like, here is this shot I always take and show you it from every wedding. It feels lame because you want to be an artist, but you have to balance that. You know, like I was just saying, finding a location that no one else is going to do and shooting your iconic style shots for you. And then also, you know, the back of the dress and the dress in the window and the, you know, like, cause that's just what people expect overall, but not making it classic in the sense of copying shots, but more so classic in the sense of the styles of shots in your style, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. No, that does make sense. Do you, so there's a lot of very trendy shooting styles and editing styles right now and photography is kind of taking a shift towards like a more timeless like I don't know like black and white there's blurry there's a lot of grain there's direct flash like how do you find yourself fitting into this like shift and how are you if you do are shifting if you feel like you are shifting are you communicating that to your clients um so I feel like not not to say that I was like way ahead of the shift because I totally wasn't, but at least you for were. the areas I was like, I'm ahead. Of, oh, no. I am the trend. <laughs> but like, at least it always has felt like, especially when I moved back to North Carolina, I'm like no hate, it's my home state, but they'd be behind on the times always. Mm. And it was always what's always hard for me is I'm like around photographer in these like smaller areas and like my style just stood out that like my style stood out so much that when I did a wedding expo another photographer who was there trying to book work was telling couples that if they wanted something more artsy and different that I was their guy like he was literally promoting me and I'm like bro you're trying to get work (laughs) so I was like already kind of on. So I, a lot of the trends going on right now, I'm a fan of if they're used mm-hmm. the right, like the blurry photos is actually hype because, yeah. um, and I hate, oh my God, 
like being on Reddit sometimes. I just hate watching photography. Oh, people like blurry photos now. Yes, because the photos don't have to be perfect all the yeah. time. And when you're doing blurry photos correctly, what you're capturing is the motion and the emotion of like what's happening. You know, it's not like if you just walked up and took a blurry photo. Like, duh, like, come on, yo. Yeah. I Oh my God, I hate when people do it. You like blurry photos. No, <laughs> they don't like blurry photos. They like feeling their photo. Yeah. yeah, storytelling, which a lot of, again, behind the times photographers and no hate, there's this different style for everybody. They don't really tell stories. They take good pictures. And that's, again, that's why I always felt like I never fit in. Because I'll go to like a workshop and everyone's like, wow. And I'm like, I'm shooting on 24 mil. And they're like, 24? And I'm like on the grounds like, like what are you doing? Um, whereas they're just like, you know, get a great 85 and pose them like this by the fountain and blow out the bathroom. Wow. <laughs> um, and again, no no hate, but I like a lot of the trends. Like the direct flash is really cool. It has a very uh, like movie star yeah. Almost paparazzi kind of feel yeah, to it. So it's like great for reception. Hollywood. Yeah. So mm-hmm. again, like people just need to understand like things change and styles kind of move. And right now, I feel like, because I, you know, I'm a millennial, so I kind of count as younger ish. Um, <laughs> not for my, my 20 year high school reunion is this year. No way. <laughs> I was like, what happened to me? Um, but no, we're we're closer to like millennials fall closer to what's kind of happening right now where people are tired of the noise. They're tired. Like I did a mm. wedding where the bride and groom got ready together and it was so hype. And I love the photos and they're like giggling while she does his tie. And it was like cute, you know, yeah. like so that's I'm I'm for people being like, you know what? I just want to do what I feel like doing and it's going to be fine. We're getting married, yeah. right? What's the point? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the new trends are hype. Okay. I like yeah, them, I, if done correctly. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I I think that kind of like goes back to what I was saying about how like the people getting married right now are very in this like individualistic like I'll do whatever I want mindset. I kind of feel like the new photography trends are that as well. Like it's like take this thing that's supposed to be like a trash photo, a blurry photo, and turn it into something else. Or like um, let's use direct flash in times that we shouldn't. You know, just like going outside of the box in ways that like haven't been done in a while. And it's actually like what makes someone a luxury photographer now are these like yep. trends and like things that haven't been done in so long. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's really cool. I feel like a lot of it too is, um, and it's been interesting now that I'm old enough to have seen it watching generations go back. So like for me growing up, it was like the seventies and like the sixties. And then for like, younger people now it's like the 80s and 90s which is crazy because that's again when i grew up but um that's what's happening they're going back and being like oh polaroids were so cool there's just like an essence to them like look at all this stuff vinyl records it's the same thing they're going back and being like this stuff had something that we don't have now and Mm -hmm. then adapting it it's really cool i like it yeah i do too so let's talk about um your posing so we kind of talked about this a little bit but i guess like if you were speaking to someone that is struggling with posing at weddings um or just like is new and like needs some advice like what is your best advice that you would give to that person um a couple of things that i like to do and i feel help me um the biggest one is i like to name my poses um So once you start figuring out certain things you like to do, because you'll do them all the time, um, because you'll get a bomb shot and you'll be like, that was awesome. And you'll keep replicating it and then try to give it a name that's recognizable and like cute. Um, So even like forehead to forehead, I call it head cuddling because that's what my wife used to call it at one point. (laughs) Um, So something different and it, it will make the couple remember that. So name your poses in some kind of way that works for you. And then be comfortable communicating what it is you're doing with your couples. So like when I talk to my couples, and this is beforehand, I'm a very upfront prep because what I've learned in my 10 years of customer service is how you lead someone's mentality gets you to the end goal. Okay. So me telling them stuff upfront is actually me 
prepping the end goal that I want. So I explain to them like, hey, I like to do what I call natural posing where it's not going to be super stiff, but I am going to place you in a spot so it looks good. And then I'll let you all fill in the gaps. And for the couples who like more candid stuff that works for them, because there's twofold that they know that I'm at least still getting a shot. I'm not just like, yeah, do whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm also not so stiff that they're going to feel like this is not candid anymore. And now I feel like I'm on a Sears catalog or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so explaining to them like what you generally like to do or how you're good, even at the beginning of like an engagement session, you know, I'll be like, Hey guys, we're just going to be hanging out. Don't take this too seriously. We're going to have a good time. You know, I'll let you know what to do. And if anything looks bad, I might let you know to move a hand or something, but like, we're going to have a great time. I'm already prepping them. Like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be great. We're going to have fun. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I start breaking out silly pose names and stuff. And yeah, it just helps along. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Kind of going back to like your wedding prep thing, like is there anything else that you do with your couples to kind of prep them before you just show up and shoot? Like what does your prep process look like? Oh, yeah. Um, A lot of it is just meetings beforehand. Like aside from the meeting before booking and then the engagement session itself is kind of prep as well. Because again, with naming my poses, while we're in the session, I let them know this is generally how I'll do their portraits as well. So that when we get to the wedding day, and I'm like, oh, this is great for Wide Shot Wednesday. They know what that is. And they're like, oh, great. And they're already like getting it ready. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have a meeting the month of the wedding. So like a couple weeks before. Um, and this is this is actually a common thing because I hear photographers. They're like, how do I get these weddings with all these nice like flat laid details and stuff? You have to let your couple know to get that stuff if they want it. So I'll let them know in that pre-wedding meeting like, hey, you know, Get a shoebox and put all your stuff in it so that when I show up, it's not like, hey, where's this and that and the jewelry and the inventory? Like, just get it all in one place. So I could ask your mom, maid of honor, best man, somebody, and they could just hand me the box. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a lot of that. It's just a lot of this is what you need to do to make it smooth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prep, prep work everywhere often, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Prep work is so important. I think it's like, like you said, it just preps the minds of your clients also just like clears any expectations if they have, if they're expecting you to do one thing and then you show up and do the other thing, like by you just telling them I'm like a natural, like I do natural posing, they're prepped in their head of like, okay, this is how it's going to go. Um, you know, like I think just kind of like putting out the obvious and reminding them of obvious things is the best thing you can do. Cause no one wants to show up and be like, Oh, this is not what we talked about. Like that's, that's the worst feeling. (laughs) And then that's when your days fall apart and then a couple don't like you. Because, again, everything is based on feeling. So if you can get ahead of that, you don't have to worry about like, oh, I had the most terrible wedding and the couple was the worst. Probably was you didn't communicate correctly mm-hmm. and y'all just weren't on the same page. That's at least what I've personally found. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's a really good point when you said everything's based on feeling. That really hits. Um, so since we're still talking about posing a little – what are your favorite bridal party poses? Like if you had to pick, let's say one bridal party pose and like one couple's pose that you do on a wedding day, if you could only do one. I know. Um, and it's the most corny, but for the bridesmaids, I always like the, the laughing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I normally, I always shoot it like wide and kind of up. So it's only like chest up and then like a lot of headroom. I don't know why I like that. I absolutely love that shot. Okay. Um, for the couple, and I think it, it depends on the couple in the location, but that's true. I don't know. I, I like a good classic reverse spoon as I call it. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That's bright on the back, especially if the groom is taller and she can just like nuzzle up on him. Yeah. So she's like on his back, basically. Mm-hmm. And I usually take two shots. I'll take that shot and then a closer up one of just her. But, you know, I like this. I'm going to give you a second one, too. My second favorite is um, a normal spoon with a bear hug over the top. Yeah. Because I usually make my couples play a game and I get like natural laughs out of it. It's kind of fun, depending mm-hmm. on the couple. So, yeah, yeah, those those would be my two favorite. Yeah. How do you like... <laughs> So you, depending on the couple, how do you know like what couples are going to be down for like the 
fun, crazy stuff? Or like, do you change your poses based on like what people are down for and not down for? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I change my poses all the time. And it, so again, I tend to shoot candid ish, but then sometimes I'll get couples who like, Oh, we want to be very like foggy. And I'm like, cool. So I'm gonna get extra posy with y'all. Or mm-hmm. other times I have couples who barely want to take pictures at all. So then I'll get a little bit more candid and that also goes with how silly they are. So generally I can tell how they interact with each other. And if they tend to be a little bit more like silly or even like, (laughs) I guess for lack of a better word, like raunchy, like they like to joke around certain kind of ways, then I'll lean into that. Or even um, couples who don't mind climbing up on the side of something like I'll, I'll push for that stuff just a little bit, but I won't like, go for it all the time. So I usually will ask. I'm like, oh, you know, do y'all mind coming over here? And they'll be like, oh yeah, let's do it. And I'm like, oh word. And then that's when for the rest of the session now I'm like, hey, we about to climb up this tree and go over to, you know, like right. But it, yeah, it really you kind of you can tell. You can tell up front, even just by like cause that's usually so take an engagement session, for example, I'll start out and I always tell them like, I do my engagement sessions up to four hours. I like quote three and a half to four hours. We usually don't use all the time, Mm -hmm. but I tell them it's because it helps us have a good session because one hour is not enough time. It's because it's like in one hour, you're still the third wheel, like two, two and a half hours. Like y'all should be comfortable making out in front of me and Mm -hmm. not feel weird. And usually that's what we can lead to. So that's how I kind of gauge how I'm going to pose too, because that's what happens is they mm-hmm. start getting super comfortable within that second hour. And then it's like, okay. 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 Um, okay. That leads me to two questions. One, do you do anything during a wedding day that kind of prompts candid moments? Okay. Like at like a reception or something like, is there anything that you are orchestrating to get a moment, a candid moment, even though it's like, you're kind of making it happen? Uh, a little bit. I think it's just how I, set up some certain poses but i don't do anything like drastic like go find the best man and like hey run over there and do this one thing i don't do anything that um it's more so setting up people in certain situations which ends up leading to candid moments gotcha okay because i in my head i was thinking of this thing that i recently started doing and it actually works pretty well It, it like during the reception i'll go up to like Whoever, like, I feel the most comfortable with, whether it's the maid of honor or, like, I don't know, it could be a family member, mm-hmm. just someone that's, you know, talked to me a little bit. And, like, during dinner, I'll go up to them and be like, hey, can you, like, tap your glass and, like, get everyone to start doing, like, the clinking glass thing? And then I'll have my shot set up already because, like, I'll get the shot of the couple kissing. But then usually after that, you know, they laugh and it's, like, this whole thing or sometimes they stand up. So that's something that popped into my head where it's, like, you can orchestrate those little moments but like, you know, obviously not like go and like <laughs> cause this whole like thing that, you know, doesn't exist. Like not yeah. that, but like, you know, just the little things like kind of egging things on a little bit. If like people aren't hype, you know, kind of hyping things up, you know. Whatever. Yeah. And I mean, I do some of that. Like, again, it depends on the crowd. Like I'll dance on the dance floor and hype people up that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times actually speaking. So what you do is cool. What I do, especially for that specific situation, is I just fake the stuff. There's certain things <laughs> that I know that, you know, like when grandma on the dance floor is like, or somebody is like, oh, the baby's dancing, like you haven't shot that 50 times already. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times what I'll do, because no one's going to really remember, is I'll fake the shot. So when the couple first sits down, instead of waiting for everyone to clink their glasses all the time, I'll be like, hey, before y'all eat, can y'all kiss real quick? So now there's the photo. Mm-hmm. And that can be remembered by everyone. It's like, oh yeah, we were clinking the glasses and never kissed, but that's really it wasn't. So like, <laughs> that's that's what I'll do sometimes. Cause yeah. eventually sometimes it gets annoying for the couple. You know, right. like on a wedding day where the couple right. is just like, we just want to chill. Like, mm-hmm. and y'all are over here trying yeah. to take pictures. And so normally I'm like, here's the memory. It was fake, but whatever. You're not gonna remember anyway. And then right. yeah, I yeah. leave them alone. Sometimes I feel like Like sometimes do you ever have like feeling like being the photographer is almost like a burden sometimes where it's like, you know, you need more shots, but like, I don't know, like the couple's not feeling it or whatever. So that's like, 
most of the time I will do like the thing where I'll ask someone to clink their glass because it's like, I feel like I've asked them for so many photos that I want them to feel like this is like an organic moment, even though it's like really not, you know what I mean? Yep. Yep. I I try my best to like get to a point where I'm going to leave them alone. And that's usually, that's it for me. It's that one, like, can y'all kiss for me? And then I'm pretty much for the rest of the night, just like y'all are partying now. Like no more from me. Mm -hmm. That's it. Cause really like the photographer's time is the start of the day up until reception even up until ceremony before then that's all us we're like all on it we're like do this do that move here come here this is the stuff reception i'm pretty much like great i'm not going to ask anything of you Mm -hmm. and then you can tell when couples are over it so i won't even do like sunset photos sometimes because i know i'll have enough so i'm just like i'm not even gonna bother them yeah yeah i've had many couples like just say we don't want to do sunset photos it's fine you know Mm -hmm. they're just over it so I have to ask, with your, you said three to four hour engagement sessions, and then with your wedding days, how many photos do you find yourself delivering for like each of those things? Yeah, um, engagements tend to be around 100 to 200 photos, depending. Because um, again, the three to four hours and more so because I do two locations. Okay. So it's really, again, getting the mentality right. It's me being like, hey... We're not going to be rushed. We're going to take time. Y'all can do two locations and an outfit change if you like. A lot of times we hit two and a half hours and couples are like good to go. Mm -hmm. Um, Wedding days. Normally I'm delivering a thousand to maybe 1500. I quote an average of 650. um, But I normally over. But yeah, like an eight hour day is like a thousand ish. Okay. Yeah, that's about the same as me. Okay, I was just wondering. I was like, are you shooting for four hours and delivering 20 photos? Like, I just need, I needed to know. <laughs> yeah, engagement session, you get five photos. No, people <laughs> actually do that, though. Like, <laughs> oh, man, that's crazy. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about, like, on a wedding day, if there are problems that arise as these things happen, you know, problems occur, what are like, I guess, some of the most common problems that you run across? And then how do you handle those things as the photographer? Oh my God. The the most common, and this this is for all the newer photographers, the most common is getting ready takes too long. Usually mm. because of the makeup artist. No hate. What happens, because it's actually not even always the makeup artist's fault, is that the couple will get one makeup artist. And they'll have to do like 10 faces yeah. and they just can't. Um, it's too much. They need like two to three people doing it. So that uh, hands down is probably the most often and it will make everything run late. And if you let your bride get stressed over things running late, then the rest of the day will be bad too. Um, unfortunately, there's not a direct way to deal with it. However, your demeanor an approach. And I think, again, the meetings beforehand are what really help. Um, I know one thing I tend to do is I show up to my weddings an hour early. Um, And even that helps, I think, because even if stuff starts running late, I've already done everything I need to do. So I'm like there and ready. And it's like, it's, it's fine. And I can, that's a part I can say when people start getting like, oh my God, we're running late. And I'm like, it's all cool. I've already gotten everything else. I've done the groom. I've done all his stuff. I got some extra photos of the boys because we had the time, which means we don't have to do it later. We're good. It's it's fine. It's cool. Like stuff like this happens. Um, And normally that helps Mm -hmm. because it's like, okay, my photographer is on top of it. So like, I don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. Um, and then also other people will be like, the day won't start without you anyway and stuff like that. So Yeah. I mean, like Loki, that that is true. They're <laughs> not true. they're not wrong. <laughs> I feel like a lot of the times like my couples are like, if my photographer is not stressed, then I'm not stressed. Exactly. So I'll be like, even though on the inside I am like freaking out, like actually like having an anxiety attack yeah and I'm like we are screwed but like I will look at my couple and be like it's totally fine like we got this no big deal everything will work out you know I think it's just maintaining the calm cool collected like 
that's going to maintain that magical feeling throughout the day. If you're like being a jerk and being stressed, like, Oh yeah. No, that's just like rude on someone's wedding day. Like the least you can do is just put a smile on her face. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I kind I have a few more questions. These are like, <laughs> these will be interesting to hear your answers. to. <laughs> um, okay. So this one's, this is just like a generic question. I just wanted to hear like, if you had just like one piece of advice to give yourself when you are starting weddings, like if you could go back and tell yourself something, what would you say? Probably not every couple is your couple. I had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> that's yeah. That's actually like a really good piece of advice. Cause I feel like yeah. you try to be everyone for, you try to be like the person for everyone when you f- first start. And yeah, like, like be cool with saying no to couples and being like, yeah. I'm not the photographer for you. Yeah. Because once I got there, it was amazing. And again, right. I'm not mean to couples. It's just I can tell like, yeah. you know what? You're not going to like me. Like, I want you to have what you like. Mm-hmm. That's not me. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel like it saves you a lot of heartbreak too. And like, because oh you just get really attached to these couples. And then it's like, oh, they didn't even like my style to begin with. Like. Why don't I even book them in the first place? But yep. like there is a point in time where it's like you just book whatever you can get. Like you just need the money or like you just need the experience. So like I get both sides, but yeah. 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 That's good advice. Okay. So this is what I'm excited to hear your answer for. What is the craziest thing that's ever happened to you at a wedding? Or like the craziest thing that's ever happened at a wedding? Uh, you know. I never have a lot of crazy. I have like cool stories that ended up being nice, but crazy. Ooh. Not, not. I mean, okay. I, I, there's two stories. So the first one was not crazy, but it was like a rainy day where, and this it's more, it's a highlight story for me. Cause I've never seen a couple be this cool, but talking about your photographer being calm, mm-hmm. they were supposed to have an outdoor ceremony and it was raining. Like it was, raining pretty hard we're like out in the mountains um and we were all looking on dark sky which was the best app for weather rip because apple bought it and now oh i know (laughs) and apple weather is just not it but so we're like looking at dark sky like look it's saying there's maybe 10 more minutes left first off the couple was cool enough to finish some of their portraits in the rain because they were so comfortable their guests show up while it's raining and instead of just like washing the whole outside ceremony they ended up doing their cocktail hour twice so they did it while the guests arrived while they waited for the rain to stop and then the rain stopped and they had their ceremony outside and then cocktail hour afterwards um that was like the coolest thing i'd ever seen and the shot of them walking back out after they got married is like hands down one of my favorite shots yeah. Not only because the shot turned out so well and they're just like so happy, but the story that goes along with it. So it's like, I, I have it on my wall somewhere, like one of my favorite shots ever. Wow. Um, there was that story. And then my other story of when I had like the venue coordinator literally yelling at me about how the couple needed their hors d'oeuvres and stuff while they were hot. So I'm not hating on the guy, but this was like a, um, like a Jewish like a half Jewish wedding. So they were doing like the ketubah signing and stuff. Okay. Um, everything was running late. That's a normal thing on weddings. And I kept telling him like, we have to get portraits in because we won't be able to get them in. He's like, they have to eat this food. So we're like arguing. Um, he's like full on yelling. And I tend to be the person, I'm water under the bridge type guy. So I was like, you know what? Whatever, I'll figure it out. Um, I had such a good rapport with my couple that when they got done with the ketubah signing, they were like, no. John is taking our photos. And this dude's face was hurt. He was just looking at me like, what? They're turning down the food? And I'm just in the back like, hey, yeah. What did I tell you? (laughs) I I love taking out my enemies without having to do it myself. Yes, that's that's true. It's it's fun. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is so funny. I have like... My stories are just like actually crazy psycho disasters that have happened. Oh no. Oh, you know, like, I had I had a bride fall in in mud. That was another <gasps> bad story too. <laughs> that was one of the worst. What did she do about her dress? She was a trooper. Ba- basically what happened was um it was me, bride and groom, and we're gonna take some shots. It had rained earlier. 
and we're in this parking lot and both me and him are like, let's walk around this way to get to where we wanted to take this one shot. And she decided to go over this grassy part because it was the straight line, mm-hmm. slip, mud. We haven't even done first dance yet. Um, and clearly she was very upset, but she would, held it together. Um, and then she changed. She had a change, like oh, a okay. reception. So she just changed into that beforehand. But Okay. When she fell, I was like, oh, my God. And it yeah. was just mud all the way. Yeah. Side. You just feel so bad. I had yeah, it was a, the worst. a bride that, like, cleaned her dress, like, after portraits. Like, literally threw her dress in the sink and, like, scrubbed it. Wow. And then, like, everyone was using hair dryers to clean it off. And it ended up, like, drying and being, like, perfect. But I just remember being, like, if this doesn't go well, like, your dress is ruined. <laughs> Can't you just take the witness out in Photoshop? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I officially quit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just take the cameras off. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> cool. Okay, so my last question for you, because this has been a really good interview. If you could go back to your beginner self, not like just like weddings, but like just you as a beginner photographer, what would you tell yourself? Hmm. Such a hard question. I know. I I like to hit them with the hard ones every once in a while. (laughs) You know, honestly, I don't know. Charge more? Yeah. My wife used to give me so much crap. She was like, bro, it took me like four to five years before I started charging decent amounts. So, yeah. Wow. And especially like, I never, you know, like a lot of photographers will do their like recap where like, this is when I started and the photos are like straight trash. Like my (laughs) photos were never that bad. Like, if I showed you my first wedding, you'd be like, oh, that's actually not so bad. So I, I could have been charging in the thousands early. Right. It took me forever. Yeah. You just yeah. don't feel like it's like you're worth it. Like, you feel like this imposter syndrome. Yeah. Well, and sometimes, too, you know you don't have the experience. Because that's – I um I got a one-star review, like, literally my third wedding I'd ever done or something like that. It was the worst Wow. Um, that that was the comment earlier about not every couple is for you. Oh. So I learned that the heart, it was the worst experience. Um, okay. They did chargebacks on their credit card. <gasps> but not only did they do that, they did them on like holidays. So actually, I didn't even notice it, but I was talking about it because I it's one of the um, the things I talk about at workshops. And I was looking at the picture I took of the one star review and it was on December 22nd. So like they were literally like, it'd be like December 24th, charge back. And it was like, word y'all. It was like any holiday they could find. It was. So yeah, yeah, I think also too, sometimes, you know, you don't have the experience, but again, like I definitely could have been charging more Mm. earlier. Yeah. That's a, that's a good, probably for a lot of people listening, they probably feel the same, like, They feel like they should be charging more, but just for some reason, they have some reason in their head that they shouldn't, but like, this is everybody's sign to bump your price up. Just do it. Yeah. And that's, I'll add a note to that too, for anyone listening as well, who feels like they, they're looking at someone's work and they're like, oh my God, I could never charge that much. You'd be surprised that even me where I'm at now charging my prices, I still feel like I can't raise my prices and I probably Mm -hmm. could raise them more. So like that's, it's an ongoing For all the people you think are so amazing and are charging great rates and you're like, how do they do it? They're also looking at somebody else who charges even more than they do. And they're like, how? so it's don't feel bad where you are and realize that we all deal with imposter syndrome. And I think that sometimes helps be like, oh, you know what? I can do this. Like Mm -hmm. the greats I look at are struggling with it, too. So we're all human. (laughs) That's a great way to end it. Look at that. You just wrapped it up so nicely. <laughs> um, before we peace out, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you, follow you, um, watch all your videos, whatever. Yes. So I am on the internet as at JBIV photography, pretty much everywhere. YouTube, Instagram, um, not Facebook, but places. Right. That's on okay. The interwebs. But yeah, YouTube is the Facebook. place. Check out my full wedding day videos. They're hours yeah. long of mm-hmm. watching how a whole wedding is done. It's fun stuff. Yeah, for real. I was just watching one before we did this interview. So <laughs> guilty. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much, John, for coming on today's episode. Um, it was so great chatting with you. And thanks for sharing all of your little pieces of wisdom with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, all right. Everyone, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening.